on November 29, 1981, at 7.45 a.m., Natalie Wood's body was found floating face down in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of the Catalina Islands, Blue Cavern Point. Just a short time earlier, she was with her husband, Robert Wagner, on the yacht of the Splendid, along with her co-star, Christopher Walken. She was reportedly last seen by Robert Wagner, who claimed to have gone to her cabin to kiss her goodnight, only to discover her missing and most likely no longer on the boat. Was Natalie's fall off the boat simply an accident and although tragically easily explainable, or was there something far more sinister at play? This is the story of the mysterious drowning of Natalie Woods. Before we get into today's story, my name is Jennifer and I am a psychic, intuitive, and tarot reader. And if you like the work that I do here, I would ask you to check out my Patreon page. Any support would be extremely appreciated with my heartfelt thanks. I'll leave the link in the description box below. And if you're a fan of the dark and mysterious with a little tarot thrown in for good measure, then I am the girl for you. I upload two times a week on this channel. And if you're really a fan of tarot, you can join me on my other channel Jennifer Walker Zen so if that's of interest to you I would ask you to like subscribe and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my uploads now let's get into today's story Natalie Woods was born Natalia Zakarenko on July 20th, 1938 in San Francisco. She was nicknamed Natasha by her parents, Nick and Maria. Her parents were born Russian immigrants and because of this, her father was finding it increasingly difficult to find employment. After a few months of struggle to find work, he decided to change their family name from Zakarenko to Gurdon, which actually did turn things around. Natalie's father was very low-key, mild-mannered person. Her mother, however, was a different story. She was extremely outgoing and very social and often dreamed about socializing with Hollywood elites and was completely enamored with glamour and fame. She often referred to Hollywood actors and actresses as royalty. It has been heavily suggested that Maria's primary focus was turning her little girl into an actress. She frequently took Natasha to the movies, and by the age two, Natasha was a regular moviegoer. Natasha was unusually quiet and very attentive while watching the movies, almost as if she was absorbing everything she was viewing on screen. When it became clear to Maria that Natasha was just as taken with Hollywood cinema as she was, it became clear to her what she needed to do, and that was to make her daughter a movie star. When Natasha Natasha was four, her mother came across an opportunity to put her plan into action. A film company came on location and was looking to cast a little girl in a bit role. All they needed her to do was drop an ice cream cone. Maria, hearing this, quickly rushed her daughter to the set of the film Happy Land. Natasha instantly charmed the director and won the bit part. She was barely seen in the movie, but within a year, Maria announced that the family was moving to Los Angeles to pursue Natasha's acting career. By this time, Natasha was just six years old, but extremely terrified. The unfair burden her mother Maria put on her was sadistic at best. She was told by Maria that if she didn't do a good enough job, her life and career would be over and her family would be ruined and fall apart. After eight months of rejection, Natasha got a chance to read for a role of an orphan in a drama, Tomorrow is Forever, starring Orson Welles. Her character was required to cry, so Maria, not leaving anything to chance, brought with her a butterfly in a glass jar. Knowing Natasha to be sensitive, she tore the wings off the butterfly in front of Natasha, who in turn cried as if it were coming from the very depths of her soul. Natasha's tear-filled screen test won her the part for which her hair was dyed blonde. With coaching from her mother, Natasha became the perfect professional, polite, smart, and above all, obedient. A short time later, International Pictures offered their new discovery, a seven-year contract 
However, with one catch, she needed to change her name. Natasha Gurdon was too foreign sounding and they needed her to have a more American sounding name to make her more marketable. After a bit of beta testing, it was decided that her new name would be Natalie Woods. Natasha was furious and extremely unhappy. However, she was young and above all else, she was obedient. Natalie did her best to accept the change and move on. Little did she know there were a lot more compromises to come in the future. The success of tomorrow is forever did not go unnoticed. And as a result, one of Hollywood's biggest studios, 20th Century Fox, hired the gifted Natalie for a modest holiday theme comedy movie called It's Only Human. The film would eventually be renamed Miracle on 34th Street. The Miracle on 34th Street became a surprise smash hit. And at the age of nine, Natalie Wood was a bona fide movie star. In 1947, her mother signed a seven year deal for her daughter with 20th Century Fox. The nine year old now earned $800 a week supporting a family that now included her new baby sister, Lana. Natalie next starring role was in the drama Green Promise. During filming, a rigged bridge over a raging water collapsed too soon, sending Natalie plunging into the deep water, nearly drowning and breaking her wrist. It's also worth mentioning here that from a very young age, Maria continuously warned Natalie to be wary of dark water. This was due to a fortune teller having prophesied that she would die from drowning. That ominous warning, coupled with Natalie's almost drowning on set, filled her with abject terror of deep water. It reported that at times she even had problems washing her hair due to the fear she felt. However, with that said, her mother refused to take her to the doctor due to her being afraid of Natalie being labeled a problem actress who had to be fussed over. The fractured left a large bump on Natalie's wrist. She tried to keep hidden by wearing bracelets. Also during this time, Natalie began to become frustrated due to the fact that she was being typecasted as a little girl, often four to five years younger than she actually was. At the age of 13, she played Betty Davis's daughter in the 1952 drama, The Star. Natalie was often casted as a daughter of famous actors, and as a result was able to really craft her skills as an actor under the tutelage of some of the most premier actors at the time. It was during the filming of The Star that Natalie learned a very valuable lesson from Hollywood icon, Betty Davis. A scene required Natalie to swim in the film. However, she was terrified. Betty Davis, recognizing Natalie's fear, demanded the director use a stunt double. It was at that point that Natalie had a revelation. The more important you were in the industry, the more say you had over what you would do and would not do. New revelations also began to take root in her personal life as well. At 14, she wanted the freedom to attend public high school and to be around kids her own age. She started to rebel against the rigidness of her mother and started smoking and dating. She even went out and bought a Thunderbird convertible. The yelling matches between her and her mother became a more commonplace. So much so that her mother finally relented and made a deal with her. She could do as she liked as long as it didn't threaten her career. Unfortunately, however, Natalie by that time had outgrown roles for children and the movie offers had abruptly stopped. Natalie begrudgingly turned to television to find work and like most in Hollywood, she felt the new medium was a step down. In 1953, Natalie starred in a CBS drama called Pride of the Family. It was during the filming of this series that she met a very handsome but also very intense actor named James Dean. Initially, the two didn't really get along. However, 
They soon grew on each other and became very good friends. It was during this time that Dean told her about a movie he was starring in called Rebel Without a Cause. After hearing a brief synopsis of the story from Dean, Natalie became obsessed with becoming a female lead. Natalie knew in her bones that this role was made for her because in a lot of ways, in her opinion, this character was her. She would first, however, have to overcome two huge hurdles in order to even be considered for the part. First were her parents. They were adamantly against her starring in a role that was seen as being against parents. It wasn't until she threatened to run away and become an actual juvenile delinquent that they tentatively agreed to let her test for the part. The second hurdle was the director himself, Nicholas Ray. He had already cast serious young method actors like Dennis Hopper and was reluctant to cast a former child actress, thinking somehow it would dilute the film. A short time later, Dennis Hopper totaled her convertible Thunderbird with her in it. Natalie suffered a concussion and was taken to the hospital. Instead of calling her parents, the first call she made was to the director, Nicholas Ray. It's unknown exactly what was said, but after hearing the details of the crash, she was instantly given the part. Natalie was ecstatic about what she considered to be her first major role as an adult. However, that excitement was extremely short-lived due to her co-star, James Dean's untimely death three days later. The movie, however, was a huge success. Not only was Natalie nominated for an Oscar, but she was thrusted to the new level of fame that allowed her to be seen as an adult actress. Warner Brothers executive eager to capitalize on Natalie's newfound fame offered her a seven-year contract. However, instead of deep dramatic roles, Natalie was once again disappointed when she saw the only roles she was being offered was what she described as lightweight fluff pieces. Natalie at this point, happy to be working, but disappointed at the quality of the work, decided to focus her attention full time on socializing. She was linked to high celebrity profile boyfriends such as Elvis Presley and Tap Hunter. That, however, all changed when on her 18th birthday, she went on a date with a 26 year old actor named Robert Wagner, or RJ, as he was commonly known. He was up and coming actor that appeared in movies such as The Titanic and Prince Valiant, there was instant chemistry and immediate attraction. And just a little over three weeks later, they got married. Her film career, however, was a different story entirely. For all intent purposes, her film career had stalled with her next two movies being savaged by critics. However, her next film, Splendor in the Grass, saw her nominated for yet another Oscar. And later that same year, an opportunity presented itself in the form of a Tony Award winning play adaption called West Side Story. The movie went on to win a stunning 10 Academy Awards. Natalie, however, was not even nominated. On the outside, West Side Story was an overwhelming success. However, to Natalie, it was not only taxing, but at times soul crushing. She was extremely self-conscious about playing the role of an Hispanic American. However, with being offered a career high of $250,000, she felt it wasn't a role she could walk away from. Furthermore, the cast and crew were full of professional singers and dancers that constantly critique Natalie on her singing and dancing performances. The final blow, however, was when her vocals were replaced with that of a professional singer. To make matters worse, her marriage was beginning to fall apart and eventually did. The reason for the divorce was said to be because of Warren Beatty. However, no real evidence of this has ever surfaced, but is worth noting that three months later, she indeed started dating Warren Beatty. It was also during this time that she decided to pick more sophisticated dramatic roles and in 1962 starred in the film Gypsy, where she played stripper Gypsy Rose Lee. From there, Natalie starred in a film with Steve McQueen called Love with a Proper Stranger, which procured her yet another 
Oscar nomination. Her career then, however, hit a wall. She would go on to star in a string of box office films that were commercially unsuccessful. Also during this time, she was voted worst actor of the year to which she appeared to take in stride. In reality, however, she was on the verge of a mental breakdown. Her and Warren Beatty soon drifted apart. And finally, in November of 1966, she took an overdose of sleeping pills and was hospitalized for a short time. She slowly pulled herself out of her dark depression by taking what is called psychoanalytical counseling. This is a type of counseling that is done every day and at that time was pretty popular. It was during these counseling sessions that she decided to make a clean break with her past. She bought out her contract with Warner Brothers and fired virtually everyone she worked with, which included agents, managers, and lawyers. She then started dating an English talent agent named Richard Gregson, whom she later married and had a daughter with. Her happiness, however, was short-lived. She discovered her husband of just two years was having an, an affair. She immediately ended their marriage. A few months later, Things came full circle where she once again met and fell in love with Robert Wagner. The thinking was that the 11 years apart really gave them the opportunity to grow as people. And at first, things appeared perfect. Even though Natalie was no longer the box office sensation she once was, she appeared in numerous small projects, even producing and starring in one called The Cracker Factory. But in 1979, Robert Wagner became a TV star with his new series, Heart to Heart. It was a huge hit. TV series, and Natalie, being happy for Robert, couldn't help but feeling overshadowed. It wasn't until 1981 when a now 43-year-old Natalie really saw an opportunity for a comeback. She believed she could restore her standing as a top Hollywood actress by co-starring opposite Christopher Walken in a sci-fi trauma called Brainstorm. Unfortunately, Natalie's insecurities were becoming very noticeable. The first issue was the improv acting. Natalie was used to a more structured setting, and this was anything but. Secondly, she was worried about how old she looked, opposed to Walken, who was five years younger. To take her mind off of work, she and Robert Wagner cruised to the Catalina Islands on Wagner's yacht the Splendor, named after her film. Christopher Walken joined them, but the trip took an ominous tone from the very start. Reportedly, there was a huge amount of alcohol being consumed by everyone, and Natalie especially became extremely intoxicated. It is then that a lot of bottled up emotions and extremely toxic arguments began to take place. Wagner and Walken reportedly engaged in an extremely heated and somewhat hostile political argument in which Wagner reportedly smashed a wine bottle. Natalie, after witnessing this, went off by herself to her cabin. About an hour later, RJ went to the cabin where he expected to find Natalie. However, she was nowhere to be found. Frantic with worry, Wagner radioed the Coast Guard and a desperate search of the harbor began. Shortly after, a detached dinghy was discovered, but Natalie was not in it. Finally, about 7.45 a.m., searchers found Natalie floating face down in the water. Unfortunately, they were too late. At the age of 43, Natalie was pronounced dead. The coroner ruled Natalie's death accidental. Officials determined she had fallen into the water while trying to retie the dinghy to the yacht. But was that actually the case? The controversy. Initially, the official story of Natalie's death stood up quite well against criticism. However, after a deeper dive in conjunction with new information has put into question the entire story. First, there was numerous bruises on Natalie's body that were photographed and noted in the autopsy report. It's because of these bruises and their suspicious location on her body that caused a medical examiner to change the matter of death on her certificate, noting that they looked like she was a victim of an assault. 
Second, the original story told to investigators doesn't add up. The original assumption was that Natalie left the yacht. However, considering how fearful she was of dark seawater, in conjunction with how choppy the stormy seawater was that night, and not knowing how to swim made no sense for her to leave the boat. Third, Dennis Davron, captain of the Splendor yacht, that night has revised his original statement to law enforcement, claiming his change of heart was due to having a guilty conscience. Dennis claims that Robert Wagner had an issue with Natalie bringing a guest with her from the very start. And as soon as Christopher Walken walked up the gangplank to the Splendor in his peacoat with the collar turned up, Robert Wagner took an instant dislike to him. Additionally, to make matters worse, Walken was fresh off winning the Academy Award for The Deer Hunter and was now shooting a film with Natalie. And finally, there were rumors of an affair between Walken and Natalie. And even though unsubstantiated, still made RJ extremely jealous. Dennis claimed as soon as the Splendor docked at Canalita Islands, Wood, Wagner, and Walken went ashore to the town of Avalon and began drinking heavily. It was at this point that the jealousy hiding just beneath the surface escalated to a frightening degree. Things got so bad that Natalie was unwilling to return to the Splendor that night and got two hotel rooms, one for her and one for him. And they reportedly spent the night with her crying to Dennis about the difficulties in their marriage and how it was becoming increasingly harder for her to deal with his professional jealousy. The night ended, according to Dennis, with her considering a divorce. However, the next morning, Natalie had a change of heart and decided to go back to the boat and smooth things over. According to Dennis, things did get better at first, but by the evening, things were once again tense. Dennis claims that Natalie and Christopher decided to go ashore to a restaurant. And by the time he and RJ arrived, Natalie and Christopher were already drinking heavily, giggling, laughing, enjoying each other's company, having a good time. Dennis also claims that it was pretty obvious that both Natalie and Christopher were openly ignoring RJ, which infuriated him even further. A short time later, they returned to the Splendor and Natalie got changed into a flannel nightgown and socks and joined them in the salon, which is the living area of the boat. Allegedly, Natalie and Christopher continued giggling and having fun when Robert Wagner went out of nowhere, picked up a bo wine bottle and smashed it with glass going everywhere. He then accused Walken of having an affair with Natalie, to which Natalie responded she couldn't take it anymore and walked to the cabin in the back. Christopher Walken also left the room. It was then, according to Dennis, that RJ went into the room with Natalie and started arguing and yelling. He claims that the arguing was so bad that he went to Christopher and asked him to do something to which Christopher responded. He had no interest in getting in between a man and his wife and shut the door to his cabin. The arguing continued with additional thumping and bumping, growing in intensity, and then just stopped. Concerned, he walked to the cabin and knocked on the door. Robert Wagner opened it with a crazed look on his face and said everything was fine. A short time later, Dennis went back downstairs and found Robert Wagner in the stateroom crying, telling him Natalie was gone and to search the boat for her because he can't find her anywhere. As Dennis was searching for Natalie, he noticed that the dinghy was missing. It was then Dennis claims he asked Wagner to get on the radio and call for help, to which Wagner refused, saying that she probably went into the bar in town. Dennis then suggested turning on the searchlight, to which Wagner reply don't let's just wait and see if she comes back wagner then broke out a bottle of scotch and the two of them started drinking it would be an unbelievable three hours before the coast guard was finally called natalie was finally found around 7 45 a.m by wagner's friend islander doug bombard fourth robert wagner and christopher walken left the island in a police helicopter leaving dennis the grim task of identifying 
Natalie Woods' body. This behavior is a bit weird for two reasons. First, it's understandable that Robert was so distraught, especially in light of the last time he saw her. They had such a argument. However, to leave the island completely is a bit much. Second, Christopher Walken and him being allowed to leave together, it's strange. Almost as if there was a conversation that needed to take place. However, it's also worth noting here that people deal with grief in all sorts of unconventional ways. So this opinion could be completely off base. Now that you know the story, let's get some answers. Join me in my investigation room. Thank you so much for joining me in my investigation room. And I'm gonna be asking a series of questions for this case. Um, as well as, I wanna preface this, guys. Uh, this is for legal purposes, guys. This is going to be for entertainment purposes only and allegedly, okay? So everything that I'm gonna talk about is for entertainment purposes only and allegedly, okay? So my darlings, I'm going to be using the systems of Tarot and Lenormand and the Kipper and the gypsy so in different ways through the questions here so i want to uh, start off with the first question here which is did natalie intentionally get in the dinghy on her own to go ashore okay so let's talk about it so what i found is very interesting and i'm going to read it straight out okay there was a loss of control in trying to make someone happy there was a hopeful energy to speak a truth there was foolish manipulation and some indecisions which caused worries and concerns. There was a sad energy because of a lot of restrictions and a conversation and hoping that things could turn positive with a friendly energy. We see that there was this message and a lot of waiting and something very sudden and unexpected happened which caused a loss. So just to be clear cut about the question, did Natalie get in the dinghy on their own because they wanted to go ashore? No. Okay, let's move on to the next question. So then our next question is, was Natalie pushed in the water accidentally? Okay, so let's see what's going on here. Uh, it looks to me like what happened was there was a need to complete a situation. There was a sense of trying to be patient, trying to make someone happy. There is this friendly energy and trying to hold on to the situation to make the best decision. We see that there was an opportunity presented itself towards a commitment and a struggle, okay, that took place. We see hopeful or trying to be hopeful about the situation. There was definitely control around this, okay? The control or lack of control here because of an argument. So definitely there was arguing, fighting. Was this an accident, yes, it happened through a struggle, an argument, and a power struggle. Move on to our next question. All right, so why was uh, Walken and Wagner allowed to leave? Okay, let's talk about it. All right, so it seems like there was some sense of they were gonna miss an opportunity. Okay, so it was something to do with opportunity that they had to, to deal with. And uh, there was some hopeful energy in trying to bring hope to this person who had a lot of heartache. And there was a lot of overanalyzing about the action, but the choice was made because of a commitment to travel and far away. And we see that it had to do with the fact that, you know, uh, with their house, a sense of stability and stableness, and we see relationships. Okay, so definitely was some kind of authority here. Okay, there was, uh, there was concerns also that things were gonna take a lot longer, you know, and they had opportunities they had to tend to, they had things they had to take care of, and they wanted to be considered about this person's heartache here with the Three of Swords in her. All right, I felt like after the feedback I've received from you guys from the other readings, I wanted to sum this up in a summary for you guys to make it clear cut as possible. Okay, so psychically, when I was doing this case, I felt as though that there is definitely this power struggle going on between two people, okay? Obviously Obviously, Natalie was in a power struggle. There was a lot of anger, a lot of fighting, and through that, uh, Natalie got knocked out, okay? Uh, after Natalie got knocked out, that's how Natalie ended up in the water because of the individual that was involved in the power struggle um, thought that 
she was dead, but she wasn't dead. She ended up in the water and she ended up drowning. So I just wanted to, to use this, it was so, it's a very tragic situation, what happened here. And again, guys, I have to preface that everything I've said here in the tarot part is allegedly and for entertainment purposes only. And I have to say that, so you guys understand. So my darlings, uh, this was definitely a very tragic situation, very unfortunate situation, and very sudden. And I would love to hear from you guys and your thoughts in the comments below. I love you guys so much, and I will see you guys soon.